Welcome to the HDG Stories Podcast, where we'll share our threads of memories, knowledge, experience, and history, knitting all generations into a beautiful tapestry. So please like and share, and be sure to subscribe. Now let's get started. Those of us living in Habit of Grace know Joe Kokenderfer as just Joe K. In the following excerpts from his full-length interview done on June 23rd of 2016, he tells us how he ended up living in Habit of Grace, his involvement in city government, volunteering with scouts, local sports and museums, and a bit more about his youth. This is one example of a local resident who wasn't born here but became very much a part of the fabric of our community. Welcome, Joe. My wife and I are both from central Pennsylvania, a place called Lewistown, and you know, went through the Army and what have you, got drafted during Korea, and came back, went to college, GI Bill, got my degree, thought I was going to be a school teacher, tried it for a year, absolutely hated it. I did not like it, and so I got out of that, which was good for me and good for the students. Uh, part of my problem was I was an only child, and I thought people liked learning as much as I liked learning, and that didn't turn out to be the case. So, what, um, what were you teaching? Math, general math and general science. What age? Eighth and ninth graders. It's a hard age group. Tough. Anyway, and so eventually applied to the feds, and in some time, uh, APG, which I had never heard of, I frankly, sent me this letter and said, okay, so packed up and came down to see what APG was, and at that time, uh, Ballistic Research Laboratory was at Aberdeen Proving Ground since it's turned into the Army Research Lab. I had an interview with them, uh, a group called Firing Tables Branch, and eventually he said, you know, you can come if you want to. So in August of uh, 59, I, I came to the Proving Ground. We lived on the Proving Ground for about four or five months. At that time, there were lots of GIs, and there was what was called wary housing, W-H-E-R-R-Y. So living there, that was nice places, nice brick apartments, and they, after about five months, they said, all you civilians have three months to get out. We need all this for the military. Well, everybody is scuffling to find and a this place. This was when? In 59? Uh, that turned out in 59, 60, okay. somewhere when that turned over. So we're all scuffling around. So finally, we found a small house over in Aberdeen that we rented, stayed there. We didn't have any intent of staying here. It was just a place to live. We had, by that time, we had one kid in 1958 and expected another one. So we came here. Look around, well, not here, but look around for houses. And I was a type that, I don't want wells and I don't want septic tanks. So that kind of isolated you to municipalities, if you will. So we looked around, looked around, and came here and uh, found, I guess, what is probably the first Poldy Hirsch house that she built uh, as a spec house on Tidings Road. Long story short, we bought it. Uh, moved in in 1961, I guess it was. Fall of 61, had the second kid in early 62, worked out fine. It was, at that time, it was all a young neighborhood. We still live in the house, and it's, except for a few of us, it's, we've turned, well, a number of people have died, and I suppose we're close to being next on the list. But nonetheless, uh, you know, at that time, there were no curbs and stuff on Tidings Road. In fact, water and sewer had just been connected to Tidings Road, apparently the year before we showed up. But I said that was an important feature to me. The fact that it was in half of grace, I had no real feelings much one way or the other. And I said, we've lived there ever since. We've gotten involved in a lot of things in town. My wife likes it. We've had two more kids since then. We got four kids all together. Three of them live within a mi uh, two miles of where we live. Fourth one lives in Pittsburgh. Uh, six grandchildren. They all, except for those that have now moved on on their own, uh, lived within a, a mile of us, which was convenient, especially for Grandma, who <laughs> loved the babysitting and all that sort of thing. And so, as you do early on, I have to confess when I say early on, maybe the first five or six years, I really wasn't paying much attention to anything except working, family, and keeping things going. And then as time came along, and the first thing that probably got me interested in the city was when the move about no sewer plant came on, and where to put the sewer, because the city was under some kind of a directive from the state. you got to build a sewer plant, and there was all kind of controversy about where it ought to be built, and ended up out by the, the racetrack, in effect. So I started going to council meetings and listening a little bit, uh, again, working. I was on the road a fair amount of the time, because 
we went to different proving grounds and arsenals and stuff around this, the country doing things. But uh, eventually, uh, my own perspective, and I can't speak for my wife, but myself, you know, going to these council meetings and being interested and what have you. And so about 1977 or so, a vacancy came up on the planning commission. I did not apply for the vacancy. Uh, uh, I was approached but at that time by Frank Hutchins, who was mayor, and a lady that lived down the street from me who has since died, to Mary Frances Edwards. She was on the planning commission. So I went to her and I said, you know, what's involved in all this? And she kind of laid it out for me. And I said, yeah, okay, I'll, I'm interested. I'll try that. So I got appointed then and eventually got reappointed as time went along. And then come along about 1982, there was no zoning in Harvard Degree until 1982. One of the goals of the planning commission at that time, and one of the goals still is the case, is to create a comprehensive plan. But a comprehensive plan, zoning is kind of embedded in a comprehensive plan. So it was a matter of trying to come up with a zoning ordinance, which I will tell you was bitterly opposed by certain elements uh, particularly the, uh, what I will call the real estate element. And those folks who are, uh, it's my land and I can do anything I want to with it. So the, the reason, and that's how Harvard Grace sort of developed up to that time. And that's why today you see certain, what you would consider incompatible uses next to compatible yeah. uses in a way. But nonetheless, we went on, went through it. Turned out the three city council people no longer were on city council at to the next election, which was only a few months after the ordinance was passed. And those that suffered were Gene Roberts, Bob Whitney, and uh, yeah, another man whose name right now escapes me. Uh, he just chose not to run. The other two ran and were defeated. After the zoning ordinance got in for a year or so, the person who had been chairman, who was a man named Bill Pless, uh, had shepherded through. He wanted out. In fact, he was going to move. So he said, you know, why don't you, know, you offer yourself this Chairman Henry Richardson from Richardson Forest at the time as well as vice chairman. Henry said, I'm too busy a man, but I'll be vice chairman. So for about six, eight years, I was I was chairman of the planning commission, right? And it was interesting in, in the early part of those days, every building permit that came through the city for a shed or a hotel, the planning commission chairman had to sign the building permits. That's not the case anymore, but at that time it was. And then Continued on, and then in uh, mid '80s, uh, Gunther Hirsch was mayor. Oh, well, David Craig was mayor, and then Gunther Hirsch after he came on. And Gunther and I didn't see eye to eye on a number of things. And so when it came time for my reappointment, he didn't reappoint me. <laughs> and so that time I said, mm, "Grumble, grumble, grumble." I'm still interested in all this. Uh, fortunately, about that same time, I was able to retire from the proving ground, which I did. After another year or two of going to council meetings and being my nosy self, I decided you want to run for city council. So the first time I ran was 1990, and I guess there were about eight or nine people on the ballot at that particular time, and I squeaked through with the wow. third uh, amount of votes, and then subsequently got reelected until I was eventually defeated in 1998. I said, wow, okay, 99, I'll run, I'll run again, got defeated again. The 2000 I ran, well, I won. 2002 ran, got defeated. And the public has its say. Then finally, I, one more time, uh, in 2007, I, I looked at the council and I said, geez, there's almost no, quote, old faces. So I ran and won in 2007, and then I didn't run again in 2009. My hearing went so bad, I, which it still is today, which I can do fine sitting here talking with you and yeah. seeing you but in the council Everybody chambers. Is. It's a disaster, and on the phone, it's a complete disaster. So I finally said, gee, this is not fair to my colleagues, the citizens, or to me. So I got out of that, kept my nose in lots of things, uh, like water and sewer commissions, and about 2004 or so, got appointed as the trail steward of the North Park Loop Trail by Dave Craig, and I've sort of held that on official position ever since. I have to ask, how do, how do you feel about being involved in having to raise politics. Oh, I like it, if because, that's what you mean. Because? Oh, well, let's put it this way. In planning commission, I really liked it because I thought, here, you're shaping what, trying to yeah. shape what having to grace is and is going to be. There's not a whole lot you can do about, Anna Long used to say, what is, is, and what will be is what you make it. Uh, well, in fact, I enjoyed uh, serving as a council person, but those are the kind of things, and 
So I retired from Proving Ground in 88. I was involved here with, by virtue of having kids. Boy Scouts are still involved in Cub Scouts. I, I youth soccer, or girls basketball. I ran a girls softball program here for about six or seven years. This is before Little League had girls softball. This was Parks and Rec softball and that kind of stuff. And I myself like to be involved in athletics. And from a personal point of view, I used to do a lot of bike riding, as you know, yeah. until gravity me yeah. in one day and fractured my hip. But yeah. other than that, uh, told us that, that's kind of the stuff I've been doing now. I have to tell you that you know I'm 82. And I am definitely slowing down. Not because I want to, but I find that I yeah, take a nap now and then. And you know, I used to do two or three things a day. And maybe uh, maybe one is just enough. In this excerpt, Joe shares a brief description of the big basin that would have supported the canal in the mid to late 1800s. And then you opened up into about a 30, 35 acre big basin that went all the way back under the Route 40 bridge and part way up the North Park Trail, where they would be like a, a holding place for canal boat. Because when a canal boat came down, say from Scranton full of coal, it may not leave. I mean, it doesn't get here and leave within a couple hours. It may be a day or two until that boat is ready to be towed by a steam tugboat to Baltimore, for example. And at the time, I understand there were hotels up there, stores, probably houses of prostitution, who, whatever. All, all around that basin area, you mean? The way I understand, over towards, you remember where the Andrew Doria was going to be built? Yes. Okay, in that area. What about technology for you? Well, the imagine? big thing to me was I came to Everdeen Proving Ground, and, of course, Everdeen Proving Ground had the ENIAC, which mm -hmm. was the first argumentatively, the first electronic computer. And I had never seen electronic computers in my life going to college. I never, that was something I never thought about, it, I guess. It was built by the people, combination of the Moore School of Business in Philadelphia, uh, the University of Pennsylvania, and the Army for the sole purpose of creating what was called firing tapes. Well, which tells you, gee, I, I have a cannon here and I want to hit the courthouse in Bel Air. How do I do that now? So it was like a calculating machine? Yes. You gave it numbers and it worked out? Yes. And it took up a room. You know the administrative session of City Hall from the, took up a room that size, all the way down. And then as time went on, we had the next level. Of course, the technology again, this is early on, everything was fed by punch cards. The output at that time was punch cards, which you then use on a printer. The first time in my group, in our group, that we got handheld adding machine, the electronic, they were 450 bucks a piece or something like that. <laughs> For several years when I first started out, we were used monomatics. You know what that is? Well, you didn't have to, oh, pull, you didn't it, have to pull it, but you, did, you know, just hit a button. And that was, is big technology, of course. Now, what kids have today in the laptop can do everything that that whole building full of stuff did in those days. I mean, it, I'm somewhat overwhelmed. I'll be yes. honest. I am overwhelmed. Do you remember outhouses or anything like that in your growing up? Or were you well, already more? We had we had what, what used to be an outhouse that we used for a tool house, tool shed. My relatives, whom we visited in a place called Beaver Springs, which mm -hmm. is like 20 miles from there, they still had outhouses. They still had kerosene lights and a cook stove. Now, and that was, uh, we're talking about up until 1950, I suppose. Do you remember your phone systems? Well, we didn't have a phone until I was in about, I guess, junior high school. We didn't have a TV the whole time I lived at home, which was 1952, I left. Here we had a, I had a party line. I live on Tidings Road, and there was a woman on Francis Street who was on our party line. In fact, we were in the days of Westmore 9, whatever, <laughs> which was our 939 evolved into not like Cecil Hill, where he remembers three digits or something. Go visit my uncle. They had the strict party line in the country where you crack, 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 crank. The phone rang for everybody who was on here, and you recognized yours with two longs and a short or whatever. And then you picked up. Of course, you could listen to anybody. Yes. And my sister-in-law was a uh, telephone operator. You know, plug, plug yeah, in. Switchboard. Yep, switchboard operator. Yeah. Even with the technology, I think it's still an amazing, and, and of course, it's increasing faster and faster mm. all the time. But there's something about being grounded in the early days. Well, I'm I'm an old geezer and conservative guy, and I think 
Some of our difficulties nationally and worldwide have been because we have instant communication. Before a lot of stuff happened, we didn't even know about it. Was that good or bad? I don't know. But it created a lot less stress, I think. Now, you know, people want, okay, want an instant solution to an instant problem. And sometimes that's at the city level. Sometimes yes. I've got to think about the solution sometimes. Thanks, Joe. Next week, I'll have excerpts from Joe's discussion of the North Park, or as we know it, the Joe K. Trail. Please sign up for our newsletter at our website. And until our next chat, have a great week. We hope you've enjoyed today's HDG Stories podcast. We encourage you to subscribe. We hope you will share with your friends. Till the next story, we invite you to visit us at hdgstories.com.